In September 1872, a friend and student of Chopin, William von Lenz, wrote these words about the Nocturne Op. 9 No. 2. Chopin wanted the accompaniment to be studied by itself first, using both hands in such a way that each quaver chord would sound like a chorus of guitars. Only when the accompaniment had been completely mastered with two hands in this way, could be entrusted to the left hand alone. I know it's too optimistic to expect everyone to learn the entire accompaniment with both hands. So instead, I have another offer, a shortcut. Let's design only the first bar as precisely as possible with both hands, the bass with the left and the rest with the right. Let's search for a soft yet warm sound and do it consistently. After finding the sound you like, you will let the left hand do the work alone. Chopin's guitar choir expression is an imaginary idea, but it hints where to start. Let's design the double notes and the chords choir like. The soprano layer is melodic, and the rest will support the melody by resonating the harmony. Naturally, they'll be softer. Now let's add the bass. Before playing it with the left hand alone, let's see the articulation marks. The bass notes are staccato in the first bar, and the rest contains slurs. Here the staccato marks do not necessarily mean sharply detaching the note, but it is more about the slight accent we produce due to the motion speed. So I imagine the bass notes spicier, not loud at all, just a little kick. I use a gentle force and push the key while bouncing the wrist. The slurs also give us an idea for dynamics. I will prioritize the first one under the slur and play the second one slightly to make them sound legato and melodic. In this way we can shape each motif from spicy to sweet. No doubt this is way easier to play with the right hand's help, but now let's imitate this sound as much as possible only with the left hand and play the whole bar. Be patient. Try it as slow as it takes, and work until it sounds as good as both hands playing. One significant challenge here is to connect the slurred notes, because Chopin repeats the top voice of the double note in the next chord. Finger legato will connect them better, because the motion will affect the attack, and eventually, the sound. Simply lift the second finger slightly, just before repeating it. The pedal will make them resonate in harmony, and polish the connection. Let's get some help from the wrist to make it sound more subtle. I go deep with the double note and back with the chord. When going down with the wrist, I simultaneously rotate it to the right. This bouncing and rotation help me emphasize the double note and lighten the chord pleasantly and melodically. Here I focus on connecting only the upper notes, and later you'll hear why. Let's add the bass. The last chords are tricky because they are the softest, and the top voice still must be signified. Make sure to work on that. There are three articulation plans for the left hand in the entire piece, and we clarified the first one. The second articulation plan that comes in the second bar is slightly diverging. Here we have neither staccato nor slurs. What's the difference? The main difference, in my opinion, is that each note must sound more similar, in a way even more like a choir. More extended bass notes, chords and a more profound character. Let's keep the wrist flexed and use the forearm to bounce on each of them, with keeping the rotation in the wrist. Why even play with different articulations? Because the first one comes rarely, and it has a different color, which gives a specific feeling about the main melody's entrance. Every time we implement this articulation, the listener will feel more at home when the main melody starts. The other articulation is taking less attention, as the dynamics are flatter, which is very much in favor of the right hand's melody, as it feels more complete and in the spotlight. Let's move on to the right hand. The first phrase is four bars long, where each bar represents a smaller sub-phrase, and two of those are connected. The first sub-phrase has an expressive start, but is sweet and perhaps a little shy. The following two are contrasting each other with dynamics. The first one is enthusiastic and grows right away. The second one is more naive and somewhat insecure. 
as there is no musical gap between them, we must carefully build it up and calm it down after a smooth transition. The last one is giving the conclusion feeling to the phrase. It is vital to consider the start and the end of slurs, because the tiny breaths we take between them have a massive impact on the sound. Here the more decisive notes are the ones on the beats. The rest, mostly 8 notes, are more like the wires which connect them. The way I like to phrase this melody is simply by following the path of the decisive notes. As they go down, I calm the melody. And as they go up, I excite it. With desire. I have two small tips about the ornament. One, I keep my fingers a little flatter, and two, I draw a circle clockwise with my wrist. These two minor fixes will help you play more melodic, resulting in better execution. This motion works best with the fingerings I use because it is designed for them. And of course, you can download the scores with my fingerings for free in the description. Next comes an exception in phrasing. Although the G on the second beat moves upwards, I'll keep decreasing the dynamics to create an introvert character with the melody. We have a conclusion starting very loose and suddenly turning into a lively character. Here the forte dynamic signals two things. Keep attention and avoid slowing down. It invites us straight forward to the next phrase. Teachers often explain this nocturne by mentioning the Italian opera, and rightly so. But in essence, it is about singing. To imagine singing with fingers is challenging. In fact, the voice or whistling will always do better. Or at least more natural. Try it. Sing or whistle the melody when you feel comfortable. Like when you're alone. In this way, you can experiment and preview what you want to hear from the piano. Then you do the same, but with fingers. To play like you sing, I recommend you experiment with using more of the skin side of your fingertip. That will help you control the key's depth and produce a light but pronounced sound. I bounce my wrist on the stronger beats to emphasize these notes effectively. How deep? Depends on the dynamics. Try to keep it flexed and imagine flowing with the melody, with small relaxations. By arranging the resistance when you go in the keys, you can improve your sound remarkably. The simple equation is, more depth is more resistance, and more resistance is more sound. Before I put both hands together, let's talk about the character. Nocturne, as a musical composition, reflects the night time. Particularly in this one, I effortlessly hear the loneliness of the night and the company of the light. I imagine a delicate, calming, but smooth left hand, accompanying a warm and charming melody. I want to listen carefully to these two characters and use their traits to create a story where they can coexist and complete each other. Let's play the whole phrase. Maybe the left hand is like a summer breeze, and the right hand sings that melody, attractive but unsure of itself. Let's clarify the timing and pedaling, and then we will move on. There are some tension and relaxation points in this phrase, and I like to implement rubato to make the character sound more convincing. In the first three bars, I increase the tension towards the climax notes by compressing the timing, and in opposition, decreasing it by stretching. Not much, it's like seasoning. In the fourth bar, I start slowly, compress the timing towards the forte dynamic, and keep the tension to the following phrase. The pedaling is very straightforward. I'll simply change it with every bass note, as suggested by Chopin. In addition, I add a short pedal on the first note to avoid making it sound dry, picturing in my mind to make this beginning feel like a breath. With the first note, breathe in, and with the second, breathe out. You can add slight nuance in the first bar by letting the pedal go a little sooner, as the left hand contains slurs and staccato. In this way, the articulation will be more evident, and the expression will stand out. 
The left pedal is a little trickier, because despite making the left hand play more comfortable, it also affects the melody significantly. While searching for the desired sound, please do implement it consciously. Alongside your musical intention, sit back and try to hear from a distance the sound coming out of your instrument. Let's move on to the next phrase. The left hand again has a specific articulation in the first bar, reminding the opening of the nocturne and welcoming the listener to a familiar place. We also hear a variation of the first phrase in the right hand, with Chopin's graceful ornamentation. Following how we ended the previous phrase, I like to start with an impatient timing, then stretch it generously in the second bar, which helps me intensify the accented notes and make the listener desire to hear the combination even more. Feel the flexibility in your wrist while pushing the forearm downwards with the accented notes and maintain it with the subsequent notes by coming back to the natural position. This motion will help you avoid an aggressive accent and let you answer it softly, naturally and musically. Then I slowly start the trill and accelerate towards G. Here I begin diminishing the dynamics and end the phrase by generously stretching it. I'll disconnect the non-slurred notes to create a contrast between different articulations. They start tenderly, seeking colorful dynamics and timing. Meanwhile, Chopin extends the resonation with the sustain pedal. He suggests connecting the last and the new phrase, and coloring the first two bits in the second bar. For the rest, I will change the pedal with each bass note, and let it go slightly earlier in the first bar, like before. We have new phrases in the following section, each approximately two bars long. The first one is more dreamlike, where the composer asks for a pianissimo for the first time. With poco ritenuto, I gently end this phrase by stretching it, as if for a moment getting lost in time. Here I change the articulation for the third time and also connect the bottom notes in the left hand, contrasting to the previous two textures. This articulation sounds slightly different from the previous two, it adds affection to the melody but also brings curiosity, like searching for the wonderland. To emphasize the significant tones, I bounce the wrist with the right hand. And to play gently, I lighten the weight by pulling it up. Here the left hand will be more challenging, as the dynamics are softer. So please put extra effort to keep it very gentle. The following phrase begins vividly in forte. Nevertheless, overusing power will do more harm than good. Therefore, let's start with energy, but use it calculatedly. Let's voice the right hand's double notes and the chords by keeping the upper voices brighter and the bottom ones softer, to signify the melody. The phrasing I like to implement here is the following. Imagine in both bars taking the tension from the first beat and bringing it to the third. In the first bar by raising the dynamics and in the second bar by diminishing. In this phrase, Chopin suggests starting in tempo and slowing down at the end. And right there, he bridges to the following phrase with a crescendo. After a brighter first bar, I like to decrease the dynamics and slightly rush in the second bar. Then, starting with the crescendo, I suddenly begin to stretch the tempo. This contrast in timing adds excitement to the bridge and makes this transition feel fresher, despite the stretching.
Let's implement Chopin's pedaling by changing it twice every bar in the first phrase and the second phrase by changing it every beat. In this bridge, I recommend changing the pedal with each chord. In addition, if you are a little adventurous, you can also signify the left hand's bottom notes next to the right hand's melodic line. It will add depth to the passage. Let's hear them well individually. Each gives different taste or emotion. Resolving. Here another variation of the first phrase comes. I am not going into detail as it is pretty familiar, but I want to draw your attention to the slight differences to take into account. Although the sforzato sign is on the higher G, I like to start the ornament with the bass. It stylistically suits Chopin pretty well. Here the composer asks for a specific color, using two dynamics in one pedal. The sforzato will blur the piano dynamic, but as we clean the pedal in the second beat, a unique sound effect will come along in this beginning. Let's pay attention to the slurs and breathe within them. Contrasting to the last time we heard this phrase, I will keep the timing forward in the first two bars. Then Chopin connects the next two bars with a crescendo, which we haven't heard before. I like to start very naively here, but bravely boost the dynamics right after. It is almost like I intend to do something outrageous, but change my mind just before ending the phrase. All I focus on is bringing the higher notes to the accented note with eagerness, and right there surprise the listener by letting the pedal go playing soft and stretching the timing. Chopin hasn't specified the dynamic in the following phrase, but I like to start with a sound coming even from far. I widen the timing more decisively than the last time. Then we have a crescendo that links us to the following phrase, starting in forte. I will again rise slightly before the bridge, while constantly decreasing the dynamics. Maybe the transition can be a little slower this time. After the bridge, we have the first phrase coming for the last time. I would say it has a notice character this time. I like to be much freer with the rhythm and take a little time when an accent appears in the melody. After the culmination, maybe there is no desire anymore. From this point on, I will gradually fade away and try to end the phrase softly, smoothly, a little blurry, with a sophisticated sound. This is the perfect preparation for the next section, starting almost like a lullaby. Chopin asks for a very soft, sweet, and perhaps a little spontaneous character in this phrase. He suggests using the fourth and the fifth fingers for the most of the melody, saying he wanted the keys to be caressed with the lightest fingers. Just go as soft as you dare. The last phrase is very extraordinary. We start relatively calmly, but build it up to the fortissimo just in three bars, while compressing the timing. Let's connect the left hand chords, not only with the pedal per se, but also with fingers, seeking a sound world that resonates like a fairy tale. I wouldn't mathematically calculate this kind of polyrhythm, because it isn't a texture, but is a melody accompaniment relationship. Instead, I like to start the right hand's motif slower, then slightly compress, and finish it in a very pronounced manner. I'll generously start with a brighter sound to the following passage, and gradually build it up to the fortissimo. Here I have a tip to help you play this section more intriguing. Chopin suggests compressing the timing from the stretto to bring the tension to the next bar. It's clear. However, implementing slightly different timings for both hands can help you play more storytelling. Imagine the left hand as the impatient character, who cannot wait to arrive in fortissimo. The right hand feels somewhat forced and is almost dragged to the destination by the left hand. It doesn't arrive late, but comes as slowly as it can. Now let's try to reflect on this slight disagreement of both hands.
Now we have Cadenza. First, let's clarify that it isn't the ultimate goal to play this passage as fast as possible. In fact, Chopin said senza tempo, pointing no tempo. Considering the piece's character, it is an entirely different situation compared to Liszt La Campanella. There are 12 identical groups in this passage. I increase the dynamics and speed in the first 8 groups, then do the opposite in the next 4. Imagining to reach the D coming in the last beat, somewhat indecisively. I take a tiny pause as soon as finding the treasure and stretch the melody significantly, fading away as quietly as possible with the last 8 notes. What really helps to execute this passage properly is gently emphasizing the third finger by bouncing the wrist. In this way we add more resistance to the root notes in each group and play the rest with momentum. One single motion for each group. It will sound way better in comparison to a fixed or overactive wrist. Chopin suggests keeping the pedal from the start to the end of this cadenza. Still, I like gradually letting go of the pedal with the last 8 notes, because it suits better the sound of a modern instrument like this one, I believe. Let's start with these octaves powerfully, but also profoundly. I like starting and finishing the left hand passage slowly, but still, with a bit of flow. Wait until it is soft enough, and come out of nowhere. We come back to a stable tempo in the next bar, where I like to play very softly. But still, I emphasize the upper layer in the left hand minimally for a richer texture. We need two simple but opposite movements to give the piece the conclusion it deserves in the last bar. I use an upward motion with the penultimate chord, picturing I fear touching in my mind, because the keys are hot. This sort of touch helped to produce a more sparkling sound, despite the very soft dynamic, because it is weightless, but also quite sudden. In the last chord I will more lean on gravity, I keep my fingers very flexed and let my arm do the whole work. And this kind of touche suits very well for a conclusion point, as it sounds warm and soft. It gives the feeling of the end. Let's hear the coda. Before I play it through, I want to say a few words about the musical message and give you a bonus tip. There are three main sections in this nocturne. The first one is repeated three times, the second one, and the last one is also one time. Try saying something a little different each time you repeat a section. In my opinion this was Chopin's intention, because every time the phrases are repeated, we hear a different variation of them. And the bonus tip, which isn't necessarily easy to do, but is worth trying as soon as you can comfortably handle the piece. The ability to play with contrasting dynamics with both hands is an essential tool for a pianist. However, playing with contrasting timings in both hands may lead you to experience a unique feeling in Chopin's music. Here is my plan. I want the left hand to play with strict timing, and still be open for stretching or compressing when necessary. The right hand will be relatively independent, and move forward or backward, but always in harmony with the left hand. This approach can also lead to syncopations between the hands, but elegantly.
I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you in the next tutorial. Later.